the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Welcome to the third Sunday of the Blessed Month of Baba. And today we're going to reflect on the gospel passage that came from uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 28. Uh, the one who was brought to our Lord Jesus Christ, who was demon-possessed and blind and mute, and he healed him um, so that he uh, both spoke and saw. And the multitudes were amazed, and they said, could this be the son of David? And uh, the Pharisees, when they heard it, they were upset. They said, no, no, this fellow cast out demons by, by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And then our Lord talks in verse 25. Uh, but before I get to there, I, I want to remind you what this month is about. This month is about repentance. And we see our Lord's power over Satan and over sin itself. And we see this very specifically when he talks about being divided. Um, in chapter 12, verse 25, our Lord says, uh, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so when I reflect on this passage, when I think about um, division, I can't help but think and reflect on how divided our country feels. And honestly, it's becoming, it feels more um, divided with each passing day, whether it's politics, whether it's the latest debate or the proposed tax cuts or healthcare or any difference of opinion on any social issue or any particular belief. I, I can't help but feel that we are a nation who's divided. We no longer seem to know how to get along with people who have a different opinion or belief. And this is sad. Instead, we want to demonize the other. We want to ridicule the other. We want to hate the other. We want to separate from the other, treating as if, as if we have nothing in common. Unfortunately, it seems that almost like the very fabric of our diverse American society is in danger of being ripped apart. And I think what's most disturbing for me and how it's connected to the gospel today is that even many people who claim to be devout, serious followers of Christ show very little difference from the rest of society when it comes to getting along with one another, right? And then the devil just laughs at us throughout all of this division because he is the one who divides. He, the devil is the great divider. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the other hand, is the one who unites. The Holy Spirit brings together, which was separated even from the time of the Tower of Babel. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the great peacemaker, the, the divine mediator who brings peace uh, and unity first between humanity and God, and then what? Between each other. And so our Lord st strives to bring together even enemies those who even hate one another, even those who struggle with different opinions with one another, liberals and conservatives, right? Democrats and Republicans, uh, people of different races, um, people who come from every ethnic background, Christians and Muslims and Jews and all religions, believers and atheists, right? Homosexuals and heterosexuals, wh whoever else may be different from one another. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the source of unity and the one who brings everybody together. This is the spirit that we can take from today's gospel, right? Have you ever heard of, of the golden rule, right? To treat others as you want to be treated. This is the most fundamental lesson of love. It, it begins by treating others with respect and kindness and good heartedness and compassion and empathy and with divine love that we ourselves want to be treated. And it, and it begins here. If we treat one another in this manner, even those who we completely disagree with, you know, we begin to take the most basic step to come together toward trying to understand and see the side of the other. We're treating um, the other with respect and love that every child of God created in his image and his likeness of, that of God deserves, no matter how different uh, their opinions may be from our own. And in the Holy Scripture, uh, when we talk about the, the golden rule, our Lord elaborates on what it means to treat others the way that we want to be treated, how to build unity. This is in Luke chapter 6. 
Our Lord says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray to, for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Our Lord gives very clear directive on how to treat others, starting with those that we may hate the most, right? Our enemies. As Christians, we don't despise our enemies. We, we don't reject our enemies and characterize them as some monster that's so different than ourselves. We don't label them. We have to be careful with labels. We say things, we say it so casually. We say things like those liberals or those conservatives, right? As if they're so different from ourselves. We don't say those, those immoral Democrats or those hypocritical Republicans. We don't do that. We don't give labels of hatred and division which separate us from one another. And we create in our minds like how different those are with different beliefs from ourselves. We should never treat anyone, no matter what they believe or what they've done, as if they're not children of God, as if they're not created in his divine image. No, as Christians, our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to a different path, a narrow path. And our Lord accept, expects us, his followers, to walk the difficult path of unconditional love and deep respect for the other, a path that leads to unity and oneness. You know, we may have different opinions, but we can still treat one another as brother and sister. We can have different viewpoints, but we can still focus on our human connectedness. We can still focus on what we have in common instead of what divides us. Of course, a key point is this, that we want to treat others as we want to be treated. And we do this regardless of how the other treats us. This is a very extremely difficult point. This is the radical nature of God's call. We are to treat others with love and respect, regardless of how they treat us. Our Lord says, love your enemies, even if your enemies hate you back. We are to do good to those who hate us, even if they don't do good to us back. When someone curses you, we bless them. When someone mistreats you, we pray for them. This is very, this is very important during this pandemic, during this time where Sometimes there's a lot of conflict at home. When someone mistreats us, we are to pray for them. When someone curses you, you are to bless them. How do we do this? How, how can we act with such love when someone is acting with so much malice towards us or so much hatred towards us? This is the difficult path that Christians have to follow. We can accomplish this only when we keep our focus on God. When we get all of our inspiration and strength from him. We have to keep a, a rich daily connection with our source of love. When we're daily filled with love, then we can be in a position to share that divine love with others, even our enemies. But unfortunately, if we just look at the other, the one who's hurting us, the one who disagrees with us, the one who seems so different from us, if we look at that and we see their hatred, then we will respond back with hatred. If, however... We remember God's unconditional love for us, his unlimited mercy that he shows to us every single day, then we're able to act from this starting point of love. We love others and respect others because God first loved us and respected us, even with all of our own shortcomings and failures. He's patient with us. He's merciful to us. This is how we can imitate his spirit and be patient and merciful to others. When we're called to treat others the way that God treats us, we love others, even our enemies, because God has filled us with his divine love. This is the spirit that will lead us towards unity with one another. The devil, who is the great divider, divides us with hatred and an emphasis on the differences between one another. Our Lord unites us with himself and calls us to see the beauty and the good in one another, focusing on loving one another. Let me switch gears just a little bit. Those of you who are parents, have you ever had a day 
when your child has come to you <clears throat> and gave you a big hug in the morning and said, I love you. And then they proceed to fight with their siblings if they have siblings, right? And they go straight to fight mode. There is nothing that like hurts the heart of a father or mother as having kids who are at odds with each other. As a parent, um, a parent desires to see peace in the family and peace in the home, right? And in the same way, <clears throat> there is nothing that hurts our heavenly father, his heart, right? As having children who fight with one another. God knows that um, siblings can fight, right? And this is what led to the very first murder out of envy, Cain and Abel, right? And throughout history, every murder, every war, every act of violence has happened for the same reason. As God's children, we're not loving one another and reconciling with one another. Whether you are the one who did wrong or whether you are the one who has been wronged, our Lord Jesus Christ says, it's your responsibility to urgently seek reconciliation with your brother. It's your responsibility. Don't wait for the other. We all know that scripture says this, but for whatever reason, it's not obeyed. Why? What reasons do people give for not obeying this clear command that our Lord Jesus Christ gives us? Is it confrontation? Some people respond simply by saying, I just don't like confrontation and it makes me un uncomfortable. But God commands it. Saying I don't like confrontation is comparable to saying, I don't like honesty. I don't like chastity. I don't like being faithful to my wife. No, Christians obey, right? They don't determine what course of action based on what they like and what they don't like, right? So we have to challenge ourselves when it comes to confrontation. Is it useless? Is it useless to reconcile, right? Another reason why people don't obey Christ in this is that they say it won't work. You don't know my family like I know my family. You don't know my friends like I know my friends. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave us a command here. But in this case, I already know it won't work. So I won't do it. No, God knows all things and he commands you to do it. Are we so bold to come to the conclusion and have determined that his commands don't work? Here's the point. Even, even if you go into it thinking that it, it will not work out well, you may be wrong, right? You are not God. So you are not as good as predicting the future as you might think you are. Even if the person you confront responds with anger initially, everything may still work out well in the end. So we have to challenge ourselves with these, with these ideas. Even, even more importantly, you need to do what God commands you to do regardless of the results. That's obedience. You can't predict the results, but you do it anyways because it's the right thing to do. It's because of what Christ commands you to do. Christians don't base their actions on what they think will work. No, Christians base their actions on the commands of Christ. This is different. Is it pride? Another reason why people don't obey this command is, is probably not the reason that they will verbalize. They can't say it out loud. Not something they're going to say, but inside they'll say. Like they say inside, they say, I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. You may realize that the other person has a right to be angry with you because you are the one who is guilty of wrongdoing. But if you're unwilling to repent of your sin and you're unwilling to ask your brother to forgive you, then how do you expect God to forgive you? If you're unwilling to repent of your sin, but you just can't bring yourself to tell your brother that you were wrong, then pride is getting in the way. And if you want to have a close relationship with Christ, then you're going to be have, you're going to have to be humble, right? You've heard us talk about this before, not only before God, but also before your brother, before your sister. Having the humility and the courage to look at your brother and sister in Christ and say in the face, I was wrong. Parents, having the courage and the humility to look at your, your child in the face and say, I was wrong. This is very important and such a lesson uh, for future years. Is it delayed obedience? Okay, so I don't like confrontation is no excuse because followers of Christ don't base their actions on what they like 
Instead, they obey, they obey based on Christ's commands. It won't work is no excuse because followers of Christ don't base their actions on the predicted out, uh, results. Instead, they obey what Christ commanded. I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. It's no excuse because followers of Christ do not avoid repentance and followers of Christ don't keep pride. No, instead, they obey what Christ has commanded. So after considering all this, you know, we may finally admit it. We say, yes, I need to sit down and talk to that person and seek reconciliation. But I just don't have time for it right now. Maybe in a few weeks when the time is right. right? I've heard this before. When the time is right, then I'll do it. We have to remember that delayed obedience is disobedience. I'm going to say that again. Delayed obedience is disobedience. To be obedient to God, you must not only do what he tells you to do, but you must also do it when he tells you to do it. In regard to reconciliation, our Lord says it's extremely urgent. You have to do it now. You have to do it immediately. Right Prior to the death and the resurrection of Christ, people worshiped God with animal sacrifices. We know this. They would bring their sacrifice to the altar. They would confess their sins in the presence of the priest. And then a blood sacrifice would be offered to God. And this pointed forward to the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Our Lord said that reconciliation was so urgent that you should actually interrupt your worship to God just to make sure that your brother doesn't have anything against you. Our Lord did not say, go ahead, offer your sacrifice, and then reconcile with your brother as soon as it's convenient for you. No, our Lord said to leave your gift at the altar. Go reconcile with your brother and then return to the altar to complete your sacrifice to God. The point here is that God will not accept your worship if you are at odds with your brother and you are refusing to reconcile. We have to pay attention to this. So some concluding thoughts. I'm almost done. After the death and the resurrection of Christ, we have the Eucharist. We feast upon the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Eucharist has taken the place of the Old Testament sacrifices, the blood sacrifices. So in reconciliation, if reconciliation with your brother was a requirement in order for God to accept your animal sacrifices, then how much more is the reconciliation a requirement now in order for God to welcome you to his table at the Eucharist. Our Lord is teaching us that reconciliation is so urgent that we must do that first before we take the Eucharist. Imagine, imagine a church community where every person is so diligently seeking reconciliation that even the smallest tensions arise in relationships. There, there's like multiple house visits, there's phone calls throughout the week, um, as each person and every person is urgently rushing to make sure that all the relationships are entirely at peace before they dare to take uh, the Eucharist on Sunday morning. Is this not some far off ideal? No, this is not just a, a church that would be nice to have. This is the only kind of church that is faithful to Christ. If you are a Christian, then being content with broken relationships is not, a, is not an option. I'm going to repeat that one more time. If you are a Christian, then being okay with broken relationships is not an option. If you claim to follow Christ, then you must seek reconciliation with your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what God requires. So to avoid reconciliation is to avoid being a Christian. And glory be to God forever. Amen. I wanted to open up to any questions or comments.